a twist on the tale of the discoveries of Columbus, Copernicus, Bra, Kepler, and Galileo. The thoughts that changed the world. And the world that changed the thoughts. This is part three of a four-part four uh, presentation. Part one is Columbus. Part two is Copernicus. This part three is going to have Bra and Kepler, who work together, and it just made sense for me to put them uh, in the same part three. Part four is Galileo, with a little surprise at the end. So, after you watch this one, please come back for the others. Thank you very much. The next individual that I wanted to talk about is Tycho Brahe. Europe in the 1600s has the Holy Roman Empire, um, is uh, from the House of Habsburg. And in the time that we are interested in the 1600s, Rudolf II is the Holy Roman Emperor. Evidently, his religion is Roman Catholic. Now, I want to uh, mention he is the grandson of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor in the 1500s, who was also the King of Spain. He was Charles I of Spain. In Denmark, we have King Frederick II, and the religion is Lutheran. It has been established after a century or over a century of uh, Christian divide. Uh, the Lutheran religion and Protestantism have been stronger and stronger in certain areas in Europe. So we do have in Denmark uh, Lutheran religion established and it's uh, King Frederick II at the end of the 1500s and beginning of the 1600s, the King of Denmark. His daughter is Queen Anne, who is married to James I of England and the VI of Scotland. Um, so, you know, we do have in England in the 1600s a very strong established Anglican religion and Protestant religion. And, of course, the countries that were Protestant would be allying with each other in, you know, in the face of the very strong Catholic countries in the rest of Europe. During the 1600s in England, what we see is basically the House of Stuart established with the interregnum period with Oliver Cromwell during about um, a little over 10 years of the 1600s. Other than that, the Stuarts uh, dynasty with a very strong Anglican Protestant religion were established in England. In Spain, we have Felipe III, uh, Roman Catholic by religion. He is the grandson of Charles V. So he is related, of course, to the Holy Roman Empire. Their cousins, and uh, they do have a very strong view of Catholicism in Europe. Uh, Poland and Lithuania are united. It's a very strong alliance, and they also follow the uh, Roman uh, Catholic Church. And in France, in France, we have Louis XIII, who's a Roman Catholic and a very strong proponent of the of the religion. He's from the House of Bourbon. So at the end of the 1500s and beginning of the 1600s, the King of Denmark is Frederick II. And Tycho Brahe is born in um, Denmark. He is a Danish nobleman and he's also an astronomer. Since very early age, he's fascinated by the movement of the celestial bodies and he's fascinated by studying them and making notation. King Frederick II makes him Lord of Venn, which is an island right across from Denmark and Sweden. This island was given to him as Lord of Venn, and he really dedicated this island to his the pursuit of his astronomical observations. He builds first a 
temple. It's like a castle, but it's not built for defenses. It's actually built to be dedicated to the arts and sciences. And the name is after Urania, the muse of astronomy. What I put here is a, an engraving of a mural that existed in that castle. It apparently was a very large mural that uh, celebrated the astronomical devices that Tycho Brahe had for observing the celestial bodies. This was a structure above ground and due to the movement of the terrain, we are led to believe in documentation that the observations were not very good and it wasn't very stable. So soon after he realized that he had to build underground and that's when he created his star castle. It is next to Uraniborg and the maps that are still available show the underground structures that he built to make very accurate and precise astronomical calculations. King Frederick II of Denmark is succeeded by his son Christian IV. And uh, unfortunately, with Tycho Brahe, there are disagreements and Brahe moves to Prague after being sent to exile by Christian IV. So when Brahe is in exile, he has to leave his uh, castles and all his astronomical devices, but he is invited by the Holy Roman Emperor. Rudolf II was a patron of the arts and sciences, and he invites Tycho Brahe as the official imperial astronomer. So having that interest from Rudolf II in the arts and sciences, he actually um, sponsors what's known as the Rudolfine tables, which are basically Tycho Brahe and the followed Kepler astronomical observations. What you see there is the iconic frontispiece of these tables in the first edition. And very uh, prominently, Tycho Brahe is depicted there. And under him in that image is his island of Venn. So it's a, it's a document that Rudolf wanted to make sure he acknowledged the work of Tycho Brahe and embraced his ideas and his observations. Basically, the Rudolfin tables are going to be based on Tycho's data and Kepler's model of the solar system. Tycho Brahe was aware of Copernicus' uh, simplified system of the heliocentric model, whereby with these calculations, Copernicus had hypothesized that mathematically, if the sun was at the center and not the earth, uh, the positioning of the different celestial bodies known to uh, the human eye then would have a very easy circular orbit around the sun. And he also measured where the placement of the different uh, bodies would be. Now, Tycho Brahe made a lot of different calculations, measurements through not only years, but decades of very precise observations. And what he basically did was based on empirical data on very, very accurate observations, looking at tables of numbers and angles and uh, how the bodies appeared on the sky through decades. He was able to actually identify what were these orbits, what was the epicenter of the orbits, and he finally fitted the model to accepted ideas. So he had been born in a Lutheran country in Denmark, but he developed most of his later work in the 
under the Holy Roman Emperor moving to Prague, a Catholic environment. Now, both environments, very Christian, had accepted ideas of uh, the center of the importance of the world uh, dominated and dictated by God. And there were some concepts in the Copernican model that collided with these very strong religious ideas. So what uh, Tycho Brahe does is he tries to understand from his data how can he fit the model to accepted ideas and include some of this in his model. It's, it's quite interesting. In the Tychonic system, what we see is that the objects here depicted with the blue orbits, which is the sun and the moon, they will be actually moving around the earth. And when we think about it from our point of view on the earth, we do see the sun moving around the earth, and we also see the, the moon moving around the earth. So what Tycho Brahe was doing with his measurements was to say, we still have the earth at the center and the sun and the moon move around the world and the earth is not moving. And then when he hypothesized was the other objects depicted here with the orange orbits, they moved around the sun. So he reconciled the ideas from a geocentric Ptolemaic system with the Copernican hypothesized system of uh, heliocentrism. Um, finally, uh, he did talk about having the spheres fixed uh, around this whole system. Uh, this is a simplified version of his very complex measurements and his very complex ideas, but basically the Tychonic system has this combination of geocentrism and heliocentrism that were reconciled with the Christian church. So in this uh, talk's um, timeline, um, I did mention my my take on Columbus is that he's uh, an explorer of the unknown. There may have been things that uh, were known to him. He put different things together, but the reality is that he was driven by exploration of the unknown. He dared to use new technologies, and he really went beyond the expected. Copernicus, in my mind, is an individual who's trying to use science to understand the world around him. He's uh, doing a lot of mathematical calculations. He's using his imagination to simplify a model, but his very strong Catholic principles did not allow him to actually believe that the mathematical data that was so beautiful was actually true. Um, apparently, in his books, he's saying, this is lovely, it's very simplified, but we know this not to be true. Then comes Bry. Bry uh, does uh, have a drive for empirical accurate measurements. Uh, he does reconcile data with religion. He amalgamates the heliocentric and the geocentric uh, systems into one in order to uh, explain the world around him better. So the next individual that I wanted to talk about is Johannes Kepler. In the 1600s, uh, Europe is uh, dominated by a difference in Christian denominations. We have the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, who is a Habsburg, he is a grandchild of Charles V uh, uh, and Charles I of Spain. He is the Holy Roman Emperor of the 1500s. Johannes Kepler is born in the imperial city of Wilderstadt. Uh, it does have certain autonomy from the Holy Roman Emperor. The city is right in the middle of what today is uh, Germany, and it's said to be the gates of the Black Forest. 
during his life, he moved uh, very near his his uh, original city to to Bingen, and he studied theology after Melanchthon. Melanchthon was a friend and follower of Luther. Uh, they were very very strong Lutherans, and Kepler, within the Holy Roman Empire, he's in this imperial city that has a very strong Protestant religion, and he is born and raised as a Lutheran. He actually was known to defend the Copernican heliocentrism from both theoretical, he was a very good mathematician, but also theological perspective. So in his whole views, and he has a lot of publications. One thing Johannes Kepler did a lot was to publish a lot. And, you know, he was an ultimate thinker and interpretation of the data with a very strong religious belief in God at the center. So he actually explains, well, the sun was put there by God as the principal source of power in the universe. So it would just make sense that it would be at the center of this universe. So Kepler very strongly believed that this system did not contradict religion. And he went a step ahead from Copernicus himself. He actually said, it is true, it is real. And he did believe the calculations were accurate. In his life, uh, he actually went through a tumultuous environment where he was living. So he was given uh, the uh, position as teacher of mathematics and astronomy at a very young age in his early 20s at the Protestant school in Graz. But when the uh, emperor of Graz uh, changed and they became very strong in Catholicism, he refused to convert and his family was banished from Graz. At this time, he had already been corresponding with a lot of different European heads, but he did know the work that uh, Rudolf II, the, the, the Holy Roman Emperor, was actually funding a lot of science, advancement, and astronomy in Prague, and Kepler had been corresponding with the astronomers. So, uh, sure enough, he moved to Prague uh, after negotiating his contract with Tycho Brahe. He worked directly with him. Tycho Brahe died a few years after the arrival of Kepler, but Kepler really went into Tycho's calculations to understand painstakingly going over every single number that had been taken through decades of very careful observations. His primary obligation in Prague became as imperial mathematician, and he was to provide astrological advice to Rudolf II. This position you know, protected him so he could continue practicing his Lutheran faith right in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. So what were his findings and, and his contributions to science? He really went over the empirical data. He based his models on measurements. He looked at all the measurements taken in Tycho Brahe's observatories, and he started working on them very carefully. He issued three laws of planetary motion. The first law is that he observed, based on all of these data, he realized that the orbits were not circular, that they were elliptical. So when we have the two uh, foci of the ellipse, what he said is the sun is located at one of these two. And the orbit is elliptical and the planet goes around that ellipse, not a circle, and the sun is not exactly at the center. The second law actually explains that the speed at which an area is covered, the same area is covered at the same speed. So in other words, when the planet is closer to the sun, 
because it's closer to the sun, it's covering the same area as when it is farther from the sun, but this means that around the ellipse, it, it's going faster. So the planets are moving faster when they're closer to the sun, and they go slightly slower when they're far away. Again, all of these was done based on him poring over all of the careful measurements made by Tycho Brahe in Denmark and later in Prague. He really went over decades of looking at a single planet, when it was seen, the different dates uh, and the positions in the sky, so that he could actually issue this law and realize that it was an elliptical move, an elliptical orbit, and that the movement was not at the same speed, that the speed changed in order to cover the same area. His uh, third law is a bit more complicated to me, and it's, it's basically explaining uh, when you have the different planets, there's a ratio that actually can explain that between the two planets, the different orbits and the times where it has to go around the sun. But the important thing is that Johannes Kepler truly provides astronomy with the new concepts, very accurate conclusions based on his interpretation of data. He still published a lot of um, different um, books where he truly insisted that this was all the work of God. In his mind, God had created the cosmos in a very orderly fashion. And the beauty of him explaining what was the simplicity of Copernicus with the complexity of Tycho Brahe, Kepler comes back and says, yes, it is beautiful. It is complex, but we can understand it. And God has put all of these elements there for us to understand it and for us to see how the world has the beauty of both simplicity, equilibrium, and basically elegant movements and proportions. So when I mentioned Columbus as an explorer of the unknown, he took calculated risks to go beyond the expected. Copernicus used science to understand the world, but he did calculations, he used Im imaginations to simplify a complex model, but at the end, his strong Catholic principles prevailed in saying this is all theoretical. Tycho Brahe actually, with very painstaking empirical measurements and accurate measurements, is reconciling the ideas of saying, well, we can have heliocentric and geocentric also. There's no need to... Uh, not believe that these calculations are real. And then finally, we have Johannes Kepler, who comes with interpretation of the data and reconciling all this data with religion in what today we know is the most accurate way of understanding the movement of the planets. Thank you for listening to this uh, part three of a four-part presentation. Uh, these are the references that I recommend for the whole four parts. And if you haven't watched the others, please tune in my YouTube channel where you can find the other three parts. Thank you very much.